heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 289, covering the week of November 22nd through November 26th, 2021. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, like our Gab page, and subscribe to our YouTube page. Our YouTube page is an invaluable asset. We've got all of our lectures there, our podcasts, uh, our our Abbeville U videos. It's great. You're going to want to get the YouTube subscription uh, so you can watch so many of these things. Also, if you like what we do, go to abbevilleinstitute.org, A-B-B-V, A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E, excuse me, abbevilleinstitute.org. Give us an email address. We'll give you a free ebook exploring the Southern tradition. And it's a great book by 20 Abbeville Institute, Scho- Institute scholars. Your gift, free of charge, just for giving us an email address. That's how we keep in touch with you. It's how we keep in contact with you and let you know of some things that are coming up. Of course, we have a Zoom webinar coming up December 1st. If you're getting this the week before December 1st, 2021, it's the last Zoom webinar of 2021. It's We're going back to the beginning. It's Don Livingston and myself talking about republicanism, size and scale. Don's going to do a talk, and then we'll take questions. But um, it's going to be a, a fantastic event, so head on out there to do that. Also, if you love the Institute, consider a tax-deductible donation. It is the end of the year. Giving Tuesday is next week. You're going to get an email from us. Uh, asking for money. It's what we have to do because we're a nonprofit organization. So uh, it's how we keep all of this stuff going. I mean, we need funds to do it. So it's, you know, if you support it, please consider a donation. I mean, even a couple bucks a month, right? I mean, it's $25 a year, a couple bucks a month. What's a couple bucks a month? It's a cup of coffee or something. At, at this this rate, you know, it's a donut at uh, Krispy Kreme, right? So a couple dollars get you a donut. So, I mean, consider having one less donut a month to help the Abbeville Institute out, if you can do that. I mean, we appreciate every dollar you can send us. If you want to donate more, of course, we greatly appreciate that too. But if everybody on this, on our email list, listens to this podcast, if everyone just contributed a couple bucks a month, five bucks a month, we'd have so much money, it would be great. Uh, I mean, that's, that's something we have to keep saying. We'd have enough money to do all kinds of things. So uh, consider that tax-deductible donation to the full extent of the law. Also, share the podcast around on social media. Rate it wherever you get your podcasts. Rate, review, and subscribe. Get that podcast. Let people know what you're doing. Read our articles. Share them around on social media. Do all you can do to spread the message of the Institute, of course. Get your Abbeville Institute apparel. It's getting close to be able to get that for Christmas, but that makes a great gift. Get one of our books. We've got, uh, of course, several books out from the Abbeville Institute Press. Get one of those. Um, all of those things are great for that that person that loves Southern history. And I want to start in, in tradition and culture. I, this is what we do, right? We explore what's true and valuable in those things. And I want to start this week with the poem that we published on Friday. I'm sorry, on Thursday. We published it on Thursday. The title of the poem is The Ideal Historian of the American Republic. And it was written by James Barron Hope uh, just before he died. And uh, he died in, I think, 1887, is my memory. Yeah, 1887, yeah. Uh, James Barron Hope was the poet laureate of Virginia. And he wrote this after the war. And when you look at what he wrote after the war, I mean, you think you read, oh my gosh, it's exactly what we're facing today. So this is going to set nicely for what we're going to talk about for the rest of the week in the show. But the poem says, In the future some historian shall come forth, both strong and wise, with a love of the republic and the truth before his eyes. He will show the subtle causes of the war between the states. He will go back in his studies far beyond our modern dates. He will trace out hostile ideas, and the minder does the load, as the minor does the loads, excuse me. He will show the union ribbon and the picture will deplore. He will show it reunited and made stronger than before. Slow and patient, fair and truthful, must the coming teacher be to show how the knife was sharpened that was ground to prune the tree. He will hold the scales of justice. He will measure praise and blame. And the South will stand the verdict and will stand it without shame. What a great little poem. I mean, think about where we're going in this. 
today, right? Um, it's prophetic because in this period of time, and I, I wrote something about this years ago um, with a man named Cousins, but on the Abbey Villain Institute page. But people were talking about the problems of interpretation in the 19th century. This was a problem then, as it is today. You see, because the problems of interpretation go deep, who writes the history is often going to be biased by what they believe. And so when you have people running around saying, like Victor Davis Hanson did this week in a piece about blue state confederacies and the South won the war. This is the leftist talking points, but not just that. It's conservative talking points, quote-unquote conservative. Hanson's a conservative. Alan Gelzo, who wrote a book on new book on Lee, is quote-unquote conservative. And he says from the beginning, he is a blue, he is a Yankee of a Yankee. He wrote, how do you write a book about somebody who committed treason, he says. How do you do that? Well, I mean, people write books about people that quote-unquote committed treason all the time. Doesn't mean they actually did it. But it's what people say. So I want to start there, and then we're going to talk about Lincoln. And we'll, we'll finish up with Thanksgiving and, uh, and a personal story. But uh, Casey Chalk wrote a little review of this new book by Gelzo, The Right Side of History. And Mr. Chalk is, um, um, I, think he, I think he did a very even-handed job in this review, uh, if somebody that normally writes for us would write this review, it probably would be a little more scathing. And, of course, I've been very hard on Alan Gelzo. So I like that he was a little more measured in his response to this. He doesn't even bring up the trees and stuff. He says, well, look, I don't even know if the trees st should stick, right? I mean, is, did Lee really commit treason? And, and Chalk is saying, well, you know, isn't it? shouldn't we be admiring someone who actually sides with family? But he says, this is, uh, this is part of the issue. He actually kind of criticizes Gelzo for even writing a book about Lee. He says, we're also a bit, a bit oversaturated with discussions of Lee. Not only given retired U.S. Army Brigadier General and Professor Emeritus at West Point General Ty Sigley earlier, this year published Robert E. Lee and Me, but the countless op-eds and articles written about him from the last in the last couple of years. There's also John Reeves' loss indictment of Robert E. Lee. Indeed, there are scores of books, including many biographies about Lee. Then again, this seems to be the era of America's great reckoning with our past, specifically the Confederate past, invinced by the ever-expanding list of removed statues, renamed schools, and recontextualized historical markers. Not long ago, I received a car in the mail from the government bureaucrats in my native Fairfax County asking if I supported renaming Lee Highway and Lee Jackson Memorial Highway. So sure, Professor Gelzo, add your voice to the rising chorus, though I would argue this historical reckoning isn't really about con the Confederacy or even treason. But you see, Gelzo, the thing I would say about Gelzo is by simply starting the book of the loud, or right, somebody, he already just says Lee committed treason, but he didn't, right? I mean, that is the key to understanding the, Gelzo's argument. Gelzo doesn't like Lee because he committed treason. This is treason. That's the real issue here. But is it the real issue here? It's not. Not, I mean, Lee didn't commit treason. But when you operate from that position, you're essentially capitulating to the other side. You're capitulating. And why would you do that? Why would you give them even an ounce? An inch. Why would you do it? He says, The ongoing uh, historical revisionist project is much broader than efforts to dismantle everything that honors or eulogizes the Confederacy and its leaders. That was made clear during the 2020 riots when memorials not only to Confederates and segregationists were defaced or toppled, but those to abolitionists and founding fathers. In Northern Virginia, elementary schools that bore the names of Thomas Jefferson and George Mason were rechristened. A Washington, D.C. committee last year re recommended renaming governmental buildings, parks, and schools named after members of the founding generation. San Francisco School Board last year voted to rename 44 public schools, including ones named after George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, because such figures had diminished the opportunities of those amongst us. By the way, I mean, 
just this week, the state of New York took the Thomas Jefferson statue out of the, or was it uh, city, city of New York took it out. Thomas Jefferson came down, right? So people saying Trump was right. Heck, we've been saying this stuff for, gosh, since 2015 here at the Abigail Institute. We've been right the whole time. These events signify what progressives hope to ultimately achieve, a complete remaking of America's self-identity. Historical persons who in any way perpetuated the patriarchy, racism, colonialism, or even cisgender norms will eventually be evaluated. And if the most radical among the left get their way, place on the chopping block. Women, persons of color, whatever that means, and those with alternative sexual and gender identities will be elevated. He says, we shouldn't be surprised by this. As men and women much smarter than I have observed, there's no limiting principle to any of this. And this is true. And he says, and that is why historical figures, whatever their merits or demerits, are so easily maligned by the woke left. The dead are men and women of a different time, with different historical contexts, and often different morals. And though gone, their actions or words can still communicate things that undermine or contradict our own inflated sense of self. But we cannot let the past get in the way of our narcissistic, self-indulgent present. Thus, what started with Lee moves on to Washington and Jefferson, and on and on we go. Then he says this. This is interesting. He says, speaking of the framers, they too were traitors, right? No. They're all subjects of King George III. So they're traitors. So how do we not write stories of traitors? Do we not write stories of Washington, Washington and Jefferson and Madison and Monroe and Sam Adams and John Adams? Were these all not traitors? He doesn't say this, but isn't this what we're doing? He's, how can Gelzo say, well, how do you write a story of a traitor? Well, do you write something of Washington? Or how about Jefferson? Were they not traitors? Oh, well, they were the good traitors. Lee's a bad traitor. <laughs> it's ridiculous. He would say, well, I'm not, a, I'm not a subject of Great Britain. But you know, George Washington, a statue of George Washington, sits in London. Right? So even the British admired George Washington. But we can't admire Lee because he's a traitor, according to Alan Gelzo. And then, of course, he starts reviewing the book. But I, I say this about this review, right? And I think, again, Chalk has, has says nice things about what Lee did here um, in siding with his family. Gelzo sees that as a problem. Chalk sees that as, a, as something to be admired. You side with your family over... An abstraction over a union? A United States? What's that? You're siding with your family over generations. It's not some mere abstraction. It's a real concrete thing. It's what we need. It's what we've been doing at the Abbeville Institute, but we need to ensure we continue to do. The South is a real concrete thing. It's not an abstraction. There's no, there's no metaphysical South. It's, it's the people that made it. It's the place that made it. It's the culture and traditions that made it. That's what the South is. And no ideology or abstractions made those things. We lose that sight of that when we let the left, like or even conservatives like Gelzo or Victor Davis Hanson or whoever, define those things. To Hanson, the South is all about race. And that's the same thing with the left. That's all they see. The South is about race. Was it, though? Would these things have existed in the South, many of the traditions and customs and cultures, without race? Of course they would. Because there was, there was no African slavery when many of these people were, were arrived here, right? So uh, the first indentured servants, I mean, this, this type of plantation-style agriculture and Recreating English society had nothing to do with race. It had to do with culture. And Southerners were not alone in, quote-unquote, white supremacy. That was something that everyone in the United States believed in in 18, 1800. I mean, how many people can you find that didn't? This is the major question you have to ask of these people. Wait a second here. So if you're saying the South is all about this, well, how do you how do you square then? Abraham Lincoln said what he said to Stephen Douglas. How do you square that? How do you square the Republican Party platform of 1856, free soil, free labor, free men, Fremont and victory, free speech, free men, 
How do you square that with what they were really talking about there and the racist rhetoric used in Wisconsin and Illinois and Ohio? And how do you square that with laws prohibiting blacks from living in those states or paying a fine? How, how do you square that? If it's all of, I mean, if, if, the, if race defined the South, well, did it not define those places then too? So how do you square Jim Crow in Massachusetts and Connecticut? How do you square that? Some interesting questions, I think. Questions that it seems like the other side really can't answer. Now, the other side, 1619 Project does. They say, well, yeah, America's just racist. we got to get rid of all of it, right? So the right plays into the game. They play into the field when they start doing these things. Instead of just saying, you know what, it really wasn't. I mean, race, yeah, they became an issue, certainly, uh, because leftist agitators made it an issue. But it, other than that, I mean, it was cultural. It was, it was uh, tradition involved here. Was there geographic determinism? I mean, why did, why did Northerners abandon plantations? In fact, Connecticut was called the Connecticut Plantations. Why did they abandon that? Because they couldn't produce cash crops like they could in the Carolinas or Virginia or Georgia couldn't do it because the climate was not suitable for that type of economic activity. They could have small farms, but they could also have manufacturing and banking and other things. I mean, these are things that made more sense. Shipping, primarily shipping, made a lot more sense in Connecticut and Massachusetts than it did anything else. This is why Daniel Webster, Daniel Webster, the ardent centralizer who made his speech against Robert Hain and, of course, John C. Calhoun in the 1830s, in 1812 made a nullification speech because he thought that uh, the embargo, of course, the embargo and the war was going to crush New England shipping because it was illegal, he said. The tariff that he defended in 1832, he said, was illegal in 1812. 20 years before. You can't make it up, really. You can't make up the hypocrisy of the North. It's always there. Always there. It's always present. That's why we should have a Northern Studies program rather than Southern Studies program. But back to Chalk and Lee. I mean, this is what you have. You have Lee as the enemy. Lee as the figure we have to talk about. The traitor. And, of course, Gelzo. Well, the North was showed their real nature by not hanging Lee. He deserved to be hung as a traitor, but we showed that we're good people up north because we didn't hang him. Same thing with Jefferson Davis. Same thing with all these Confederate leaders. They weren't hung, so that's how good we are. Now we should take down Lee, though. If the time is over, all the time is past, we should take him down. Now, Gelzo is also, he studied religion. And he, look, Alan Gelzo is a good writer, and he has a great speaking voice. I'll say that. Alan Gelzo has a great speaking voice. He's interesting to listen to. Right? I, I, I won't say that. I won't deny that at all. Great speaking voice. I'm someone who likes voices. I, I key in on voices. So he's very good at that. I mean, he's easy to listen to. And uh, he, but he, So he studies religion, and... I think part of his infatuation with Lincoln is this weird sense that Lincoln was somehow this very devout Christian. And that's the piece on Monday by Thomas Hubert. He gets into this and he says, wait a second here. Now, Lincoln's, the, uh, Lincoln's providence is something that needs to be questioned. Was Lincoln really this religious figure or not? And I want to go to a... a, a the, the title of this piece is The Divinity That Shapes Our Ends, Providence in the American War of 1861-65. to And I, I, Lincoln wrote a little paragraph, the meditation, and then you, he, he compares that to his second inaugural address, which is one of the addresses that is seen as one of, the, one of these important speeches in American history, the second inaugural with malice toward none, with charity for all, let us strive to, strive to bind up the nation's wounds, right? So, 
He says this, he says, it is, of course, Lincoln's prerogative to make judgments on the events of the war itself, its causes and results as he understands them. Is it not a bit, a bit disingenuous, even unseemly, however, to do so while adopting a posture of the noble leader filled with the milk of kindness? One has to concede in any event that others in his time lacked even a fraction of the man's compassion and goodwill, even if those qualities were adulterated. The argument in favor of the second inaugural offered by some commentators rests on the speaker's comfort with paradox and his presumed charity. Mark Knoll, for one, following the theologian, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, argues that Lincoln stood out among other 19th century figures as virtually unique in this regard. In support, he references several noted clergymen on the day of the day who, according to Knoll, lacked the theological power and tensional quality of Lincoln's presentation. In spite of Knoll's assertions and his evidence, Lincoln was not the only one who engaged in paradox, engaged the paradox and ambiguity found in the meditation in second inaugural. He may have done so with more eloquence and prof uh, profundity than anyone else. And as a look at key utterances by other figures of the period cited by Amy Bradford, Richard Reeve, and others will attest the notion that God was indisputably on their side and their side alone never occurred to them for a moment. For them, God is sovereign and wills what he wills. They never assumed that personal or collective faithfulness guaranteed worldly success. That is the preserve of the New England Gnostic abolitionists out to create the utopian city on the hill. To those other figures, in particular those south of the old surveyor's line, we will return shortly. So, I, I like this because he's getting into this tension in this inaugural address, and uh, I think that's something we miss. You know, Lincoln, there was this religious figure. We have that, right? Lincoln is a demigod, right? Lincoln has, has been elevated to his status beyond what he should have in modern American society. Lincoln is not, is not, uh, was not ever really a religious figure at all. I didn't really, wasn't really that strong of a Christian ever. And I think that's something we have to, we have to get straight with Lincoln because if we don't, um, uh, It's um, we're we're destined, we're doomed to keep this mythical figure of Lincoln alive. Now, of course, we're very critical of Lincoln at the Abbeville Institute. If you're listening to this podcast and you haven't gotten a lot, we're very critical of Lincoln here. He is uh, someone who was the, in many cases, a transitional figure, the transformative figure in America the transformative figure of America. Before Lincoln, we had a different vision of America. After Lincoln, we have the Lincolnian vision of America. And, and Don Livingston calls it the Jeffersonian and Lincoln, Lincolnian and Jeffersonian vision. So Lincoln's transformative period, you know, 1861 to 65, but then, of course, beyond that, because Lincoln's ideas carry on. And in fact... Lincoln becomes the martyr, and this is where uh, you have the individuals of uh, that uh, promoted Lincoln's martyrdom after his assassination. I mean, this is Lincoln did more in death for them than he did in life. In fact, these people were trying to throw Lincoln under the bus. All the radicals they hated him. So I like this piece by Hubert. I like the piece by Chalk, and of course, this week we had. Thanksgiving, and this also gets into the the ideal historian of the American Republic. What is the first Thanksgiving? You know, we have uh, it was it was it Pilgrim, Massachusetts, or was it something else? And we have uh, Tyler, Lion Gardner Tyler, who wrote Virginia first, and he wanted to emphasize again in that that Virginia was first in all these things, and we've forgotten all of that. So thankfully, Shotwell Press, Shotwell Publishing, has published a little children's book on the real first Thanksgiving. I like this. It's something we've talked about before, but how Virginia was really the first state, or colony, I should say, the first colony to practice an English Thanksgiving. Now, we know that Florida had one before that, right? That was Spanish. Uh, but the real first Thanksgiving in an English colony took place in Virginia in 1619, an, an annual event. Now, of course, it didn't last because these people were slaughtered by Indians. But if you listen to uh, to the left, I mean, it was 
genocide that these people were practicing. The, the, the genocide actually came in the other direction, at least initially. The attempt was there. Uh, so we, we, had, we had the real first Thanksgiving in Virginia, the real first representative government in Virginia. Virginia was first in all of these things. Virginia was the first colony. The Pilgrims, nothing, nothing of that. In fact, the Pilgrims were supposed to go to Virginia or blown off course. This is why they ended up in Massachusetts. So we, we have um, this northern myth that somehow Virginia, uh, I'm sorry, Massachusetts was first, not Virginia, but we know that's incorrect. We know that uh, Virginia was first in all of these things. And I love that line Gardner Tyler essay, Virginia first. It's so good. So I wrote a little, just to scrub it up, a little uh, review of the book. And it's only about, I think, like 15 pages, 20 pages, something like that. It's a great little children's book. You should get it. It's nice illustrated. The, the a writer also illustrated it. It's very good illustrations you know, for the book. And um, I, I found it very good and worthwhile. Again, we get a lot of kids start learning about these things. And this is, you got the little pilgrims with buckles and Charlie Brown's Christmas and Charlie Brown's Thanksgiving. Simply not true. And then, of course, we, we wrapped up the week with a, a piece entitled Windy. And it's by Travis Holt, who's just a great writer. I, I like reading Travis Holt's stuff, but Travis Holt wrote this little story about a man that was nicknamed Windy in the Ozarks there. And about the value of people and traditions. You always think they're going to be there. And he talks about this Wendy who died. And he wasn't going to be there anymore. And he always just took it for granted. We take so many things and traditions and customs for granted. They're always going to be there. And then they're not. In the South, and the Southern tradition is much like that. And I loved how he said, you know, when Wendy died, he died an Arkansian. He died a Southerner. He died a man of the Ozarks. This is what he died. He died a storyteller. He died a person a man of his place. And again, you take these things for granted, you take for granted all these things are always going to be there until they're not. And so is the Southern tradition always going to be there or is it not? Is it going to be eliminated? Is it going to be canceled? We know they're trying. That's the effort to remove Confederate symbols, Confederate statues, the neoconservatives to get rid of John C. Calhoun, the left to get rid of Thomas Jefferson, George Washington. It's part of getting purging the South from the collective consciousness. And the right is okay with this. Trust me, they're okay with this. And they're okay with this because if you look at things like the Mississippi State flag, who initiated that? It was Republicans. Who initiated getting rid of the Georgia State flag? Republicans. Who initiated getting rid of the Confederate battle flag there on the State House grounds of South Carolina? Republicans. Not even on the dome anymore, just in front of a monument. Republicans, you see, the right is okay with this stuff. In fact, they want it because it's they think it hurts their business. It hurts the Chamber of Commerce. Oh, my gosh. So they're willing to throw it all under the bus. They're willing to get rid of it. And so we take it all for granted until it's not there anymore. It's, we take, it's always going to be there until it's not. Sweet Home Alabama will always be played on the radio until it's not, until it's made into a racist song. Uh, you know, the things that we take for granted, they'll always be there until they're not. And so this is why these things have to be preserved and talked about and discussed. Family, the real first Thanksgiving, Robert E. Lee wasn't a traitor, Lincoln wasn't a hero. We have to have honest historians, people that are willing to say these things and not bow down to political correctness or cancel culture or um, not just that, uh, the, the idea that uh, somehow uh, these new modern fashionable views on the South are correct. They're not. They're incorrect, vastly incorrect. And it's why the Institute has continued to exist and why we do exist. Again, I'm going to wrap up today of just requesting that if you, if you just have some few pennies to throw our way, please do it. It keeps, the podca- keeps this podcast going. It keeps the website going. It keeps our Zoom webinars going, our conferences. We will have conferences in 2022. We have some things we really want to do. 
It's kind of hard to do them though when uh, you know we have our funds are much less substantial than our opposition. And I'm not even going to name the opposition. There's many very vari- there's various forms of the opposition. It can come from the left and the right. They've got a lot more money and they're a lot better organized. So anything you can do to help, anything you can do do to contribute, you get a tax deduction for this to the full extent of the law. So if you're interested in that part of it, making your tax plans, and you want to look for a charity, think about the Abbeville Institute. Hey, go to Amazon Smile and make us your preferred charity. Every time you shop at Amazon, we get money then. It's great. And everybody shops at Amazon for something or another. Also, download that free mobile app. That's also something we pay for every year to have. You know, so download the app and use it if you want the Abbey Valens to do on the go. Get the stuff that we have that I mean, you're, you're getting out of this. You, know, you contributing keeps the podcast going, the website going, all that. So. We don't have many episodes left of the Abbeville. Uh, we can review the Abbeville Institute this year. We're going to be wrapping up sometime, uh, you know, middle of December or so for a couple of weeks. We we always shut down for a little while. So uh, keep that in mind. We only have a, maybe a episode or two left this year. But if you're if you're hearing this on the weekend before December first, make sure you sign up for that Zoom webinar with Don Livingston and yours truly on Is Republicanism Dead? It's going to be really great. Also go to abbevilleacademy.org if you want to pick up any of these old webinars that we've got. You can buy them for 15 bucks each, and they're not expensive, right? This, it's, we don't charge a lot for this stuff. We do it just to maintain the cost of, of running that through that system. That's why we have that. Same thing with the charge for these webinars because we got to pay for the we got to pay for the access to these things. So we do all that. We charge these things to keep that stuff going. Um, so get that Abbeville, abbevilleacademy.org. Great. Great resource. We've got, uh, I think, 10 classes up there right now, uh, soon to be 11. So a lot of great stuff. Until next time, good day. <laughs>